All right. The second vision I had is one I call the Prince Charles vision. The Prince Charles vision is a very interesting one because it has much symbolism in it, very similar to the book of Revelation. In the Prince Charles vision, I was made aware that it was a, an angel that came to me and told me to take the wife and the children in our Volkswagen van and go out Highway 26. When you come to the town called Government Camp, as you're coming out on Highway 26 of that town, look at your millimeter and go five miles to the tenth and there will be a pull-off from the road. When you come to the pull-off, pull-off, get your wife and your children out, there will be a switchbacking trail down into the canyon. Take that trail, you lead the way, let your children follow and your wife bring up the rear. This was my instructions. So down the canyon wall we went. Even as in all of a sudden in the vision, uh, this was an, a, a day vision. In this vision, we were went out, sure enough, in the van, the whole family, I load them in, and here was the switchbacking trail. We were winding down the switchbacking trail. The angelic visitor had said to me, there will be a person, you go down to the bottom of the canyon, and you come out of the, into a clearing, out of the underbrush into a clearing, and you will see a, a, a person there to meet you to tell you what to do next. And so here we go. We're walking down. The children are asking their questions. And we're just talking as we're going down. And I don't have any answers for them. We come out into the clearing. And standing in the clearing very properly and very poised is an English butler. He has a white towel over his arm. And he speaks very properly. He says, now then you've arrived. Please follow me. And that kind of a tone. And he just very very properly turned, not even really making eye contact with us. He had a mission to do, and we followed him. We headed across the clearing, and as I was right behind him, we came to an edge of this clearing, and it went down. And as we came to the edge where I could see down, in a lower floor of the canyon, there was a very small platform down in the bottom, about 12 feet square, had one chair on the rear of it, and a, and a microphone on the front. In front of that platform was 60 chairs, five rows of 12. I'm looking at this as we're going down and standing to the, the, the forward row to the side nearest us of this first 12 chairs was a senator and a general, four-star general. I'm looking at them as we're going down the grade and I'm thinking, I know that senator, but I don't know that general. And so we get down there and the butler introduces the, the, the senator seems to know my family and says something to the effect, it's good to see you again. And the general says to me, as they're introducing, he says, yes, he says, you're the family that I've been hearing about. The general and I are conversing, and I, I don't remember the detail. God didn't want me to remember any detail of what we were conversing about. All, automatically, all of the 60 chairs were full. I glanced back, they were full, my wife and children. My wife was sitting down on the end, and my children had been seated, and so the butler said, Please be seated, it's time to begin. And he kind of just sort of turned an angle like this away from us, reached under the arm where the white towel was and pulled out a two-way radio and uttered, uh, uttered a few words. Then he began walking back up toward the grade and the, the clearing where we first came out and met him. And as he was walking up there, I heard this big helicopter come over the canyon wall behind me. I turned and looked and could see that it was a big double-bladed one, the giant ones like the military calls the egg beaters. And it was carrying uh, something very strange. I've never seen a military helicopter carrying one of these. I've seen them carrying a lot of things uh, around the military bases. But I've never seen them carrying a construction office the way they were carrying this one. And this construction office was a blue that I was to learn later was the United Nations blue. So I believe it has something very significant to do with the United Nations, the building that the, was being carried by the helicopter. It was on these cables, they came down to the area of the clearing and very gently let the construction office down and released the cables and the helicopter flew away. From that point then, the butler went up and unlatched the door and opened it for whoever was inside to step out, which it was Prince Charles. He was wearing the cut-off short sleeves and short cut-off pant legs. And he had the wide-rimmed, wide, kind of light brown type hat like you'd see in an African safari or in the Middle East. The butler was falling behind him. He was coming down, leading the way. And I was looking at him as he came down the grade. And I thought, well, that's Prince Charles. But I said, either he's put on weight. No, I don't think he has. 
And as he got closer, I realized that his face was all red and puffy and his eyes were red. And I began to look at him and said, my goodness, he has really been crying. As he came closer, we all stood. The butler came up and uh, the general and the senator greeted him as though they had already met him. Then the butler introduced him to us and said, in, in a sense, uh, this is Henry Groover and this is his family and this is his wife in that kind of a gesture. As the butler was doing this, Charles looked at me and he said, thank you for coming today. You're the family I've heard about. You're here by my request. I have a message for you. Please be seated. With that, he turned to the general who was standing and they came up and walked on the platform together. They conversed a moment. The general nodded, sat in the one chair back behind. And uh, as he sat in the chair behind, Charles stepped up to the microphone and he said, I thank you for coming today. You're here by my request. Please take heed. I have a message for you. And then he said these words. I must inform you that your nation is at war and you have a battle to fight. But the saddest thing is, is you must fight it without God. With that, the general behind him, the American four-star general, jumped to his feet, come down off the platform, came around on the, the ground in front of him, and looked up Charles very sarcastically, and he said, we know we're at war, we know we have a battle to fight, but we didn't know God had anything to do with it. And with that, Charles brings his right hand up, and he comes right down like this between the eyes of the general in this motion. And he said, and sir, that is your mistake. And with that, they begin to argue why God or why he didn't have anything to do with it. And the argument went on. Everybody, his intention was on it. I was watching straight ahead. But all of a sudden, in my peripheral vision, off to the left, there was a motion. And I turned to see what it was. And off to my left was a frog that was so big it wouldn't have fit under the ceiling. The motion I had seen off to my left that caught my peripheral vision was the frog's head had made this motion like they do before they're going to make the croaking sound when they fill the air sac under their chin. I watched it, and as that air sac began to fill and that dark green skin began to turn a yellowish color, terror literally swept over me. I, it was everything I could do to keep from jumping to my feet and, and interrupting Charles and the general and everybody and say, let's get out of here. If that frog opens its mouth and croaks, we're all dead. That was the kind of terror that was over me. About that time, its mouth opened out came out of its mouth instead of a croaking sound, it came out a white vapor. It came right at us, it came right at Charles and the General, it enveloped Charles and the General. It was just about to hit my wife down on the end, when all of a sudden I was caught up into the heavens. As I was caught up in the heavens, looking down on what I would call like Trafalgar Square. But Trafalgar Square as giant Lions on the four corners facing north, south, east, and west. The lions themselves are up probably 10, 12 feet high just to their backs, let alone their heads are made out of brass. Well, the lions were not in the square. The big fountain that you could easily put three or four of this size building into uh, was not there. Nelson's column was there, was not there in it. it was, the square was empty except for all of the buildings around it. And the buildings around it were like commerce. Uh, libraries, churches, government office, and I, I think of Trafalgar Square is because it is a representation of the British Empire, all right, in its glory. So it is a representation of everything that you would do to run the empire. And I'm looking on this square that's, that's empty, there's no statues on it now, and all of a sudden people start running out of this, into this open square from all of these buildings. And they're all dressed in their occupational garb. They all have, uh, the nurses have their little hats on and the doctors their stethoscopes, the welders their, their leather apron and their, their goggle type hat that's up. And you can tell their occupation by their apparel that they're wearing. So I would say that this event, whatever it is that has caught their attention, has caught them and they are running out all fully aware of why they're coming out of the building because as they come out they begin to point up like in the direction the frog was 
As I'm looking into the heaven, I'm in the heavens looking down on this square. I didn't see anything but the square at first. They begin pointing off to my left hand. Now remember, the frog was at my left hand in the vision, remember? And the vapor came from him. They're pointing in the direction of my left hand, and they're mocking and scoffing and jeering and saying, you can't hurt us. You don't have any power anymore. We're not afraid of you. And they're literally mocking. And I turn to look to see what they're, they're, they're pointing at, because they're pointing straight ahead. They're pointing way up. And I wonder, what are they pointing at? And I look, and then my eyes see this army that went from the bottom of the, right by the square, all the way into the heavens, clear up to the same level I was in the heavens. Off to my left hand was a Russian general, fully dressed in his full general's outfit with all of his braid and everything, standing in the heavens. His fists were clenched like this, and they were down at his side like this. His chest was out, and he was looking down into the square at these people. At his right hand was a rectangular weapon. I had never seen exactly that kind before. To me, it looked kind of like an anti-aircraft type uh, multiple cylindered weapon that they have on ships. But it wasn't quite. And as this band of people down in the square are mocking his army and are literally scoffing and laughing at him and saying, you don't have any power, we're not afraid of you. I saw all of a sudden his neck muscles begin to thicken and his face begin to get a look of tension and he was getting angry. And then his blood vessels begin to bulge as all of a sudden his fist came up like this and he said, present arms, aim, fire. And this massive army of footmen that come from the heavens clear down into the, the level that these people were in the square. A people, this army that was stood like this before he gave the orders to fire. They were in full chemical warfare gear. And I didn't learn that until a man came back from maneuvers over in Afghanistan. And when he had me describe the uniform I saw in the vision, he said, Henry, you have perfectly described the Russian chemical warfare uniform. And he said, I didn't even know they had that kind of uniform until I just went over there myself and saw it. We didn't even have pictures to train for these because they're brand new uniforms. It's the latest of gear they have. But he said, I want to tell you something. Your description of their chest looking like the rib look of a, of, of a, of a, of a, a locust of the desert, the ones that make that buzzing sound in the summer, that was what their chest looked like. Their, their face looks kind of almost like a horse in a way, the snoot somewhat like a horse, and they have big googie eyes. And he explained to me, he said, the googie eyes or the goggles are the, the head covering they put over them. It has the goggles. And the snooty looked like a horse, you said. He says, and he asked me the colors and everything. He said, that's exactly what the chemical warfare gear looks like. That has a pre-filtration system and a, a breathing apparatus that goes back down into this rib-looking chest that has multiple filtration systems. And he said that is the most advanced chemical warfare gear that you can get on the face of the earth. And he said, I want to tell you something. We didn't have anything to match it. He said they fired chemicals across and some of my men got into those chemicals and their, their, their chemical warfare gear began to just melt right off of them. He says, I don't know what kind of material they have, but we better find out. From that time, he said, I was scared to death over there. One, one blast of this vapor could wipe out my whole platoon. Well, they were firing on the people back to the division. They were firing on the people in this square. As they fired the first shot on these people, I then saw something that I believe we're being prepared for today. It totally caught these people by surprise. They sincerely, with their whole heart, did not believe that that massive military had any power, and they did not believe that that military would ever fire on them because of the response that was taking place there as they were fired on. They were taught by total surprise and total panic. And the whole action of that group of people in that square told me it was a surprise to them, even though they knew the army existed. They could see it going into the heavens, but they sincerely believed it would not fire on them. 
Now, remember in the Prince Charles vision, I may not have made this point clear, and I want to make this clear. When they were firing on them, and the people were caught by total surprise running back and forth, I was standing in awe that, that why don't they run into the buildings? Why don't they get out for cover? They just turn and run back and forth, and they weren't falling, but I could hear the bullets hitting them. And I wonder, well, why aren't they falling when all of a sudden I begin to realize this square all around, all the buildings, all the, the material things were disappearing all around these people as they ran back and forth in the square. Now that, to me, goes along with Ezekiel chapter 38 and the reason that they will come. You go up, verse 38, chapter 38 of Ezekiel, verse 11. He says, let us, I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now answer me a question. Is that a description of Palestine or Israel? Have any of you ever seen Israel or Palestine safe? You say, yeah, when the treaty signed, it will happen. Well, maybe. They are going to sign a treaty. I believe that. But I don't think it's going to last long. This says that they dwell. The word dwell, look up the word dwell and exhaust it out in the concordance. It does not mean a temporal habitation. It means to inhabit, to possess, to settle in. That's a big difference between a treaty and crying out peace and safety. Big difference. Verse 12. Here's the reason they're coming. To take a spoil. To take a prey. To turn your hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. And upon the people that are gathered, gathered out of the nations. Which have gotten cattle. Alright. My, my, my third question. Does that fit Palestine? I have literally crossed Israel back and forth. I've walked up in the middle part of Israel. And I want to tell you something. I've never found a cow yet. Show me a cow in the middle of Israel. I'll show you cows down in, in the area of Ashkelon, and there are a few down along the Jordan Valley. Not very many. More in Ashkelon and that area in the farms there. Show me a cow in the midst or the middle of Israel. Well, you see, just one cow wouldn't do it. Because the first thing listed that they're coming to take is cattle. You're coming in, it says in, in uh, 38, to take a spoil, to take a prey. The people that have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Question number five. Is the major population in the land of Palestine in the middle of Palestine? Folks, it's not. Look at your geographical picture. The main population is not in the middle of Palestine. It's around the edges. Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, it comes in a little bit for Jerusalem. But look, predominantly it's around most of the border areas along the Mediterranean. The reason they're coming in, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto you, Are you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? I want to read to you this next article here, the Denver Post, 524-1992. Wichita. It got a bit hectic out here, Greg Ross Farm, yesterday when a delegation of 20 Russian diplomats stopped to ask a few questions about life on the American farm. The first question they ask is, where are your cows? First question, Russian diplomats. A delegate asked, oh, there are a few of them here, Ross explained. Cows for milking? No, they're beef cattle. What will be your annual revenue? <laughs> the next question. About your house. What is the footage? How many bedrooms? Well, if you're getting ready to take occupancy, you want to know all that. And that isn't funny, but I want to tell you something. We're heading into a very serious period of time.